Hello, we're here with uh, Judge Nicole Phelps, and um, she's running for re-election for King County Superior Court, position number 14. Would you like to go ahead with your two-minute introduction? Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you for taking the time, especially in these very unusual times, to do these via video conferencing so that uh, we could have our in-person interview. Again, my name is Nicole Gaines Phelps. I am currently a King, one of the 53 King County Superior Court judges. I was elected in 2016 to my current position, which is department number 14. I have served there since uh, to January 9th of 2017, and I am running to retain my seat. Uh, my first couple of years on the bench, I was a member of the Family Law Committee, and um, that was my assignment for my first two years on the bench. This last year and a half, I have been presiding over criminal matters, and then throughout the entire three and a half years that I've been seated, I also have a small civil caseload that I'm also responsible for. Uh, when I ran in 2016, I promised to do my best to be a judge that showed compassion, use my experience um, to reach the best decisions, and I have stood by that uh, in the last three and a half years that I've been on the bench. It is definitely, I've been known um, as someone who, and am known as someone on the bench that definitely uh, wants to make sure that everyone understands that in our court system, that it is a player uh, that we are a in my courtroom you are um, everyone is of equal importance and uh, 30 seconds and it's my job to make sure that rights are not violated and i continue to do that and i hope to continue doing that um as i hope to can remain um in my position as a king county superior court judge thank you Great, thank you. Um, so now we'll move on to the four prepared questions and uh, Mackenzie has posted those into the chat box if you would like to follow along. And uh, the responses to these are two minutes apiece. Uh, Jeff, would you like to start with question one? Sure, what are the pros and cons of going to the bench as opposed to practicing law? Okay, uh, the cons are that you essentially give up your First Amendment rights um, and a lot of ways we and it is important for the integrity of the bench to always have a position of neutrality um since the election that was one of my biggest struggles when i first came to the bench is realizing that as a judicial official um, in light of the politics that i had to find other ways to be an advocate and that my position that i had taken an oath to was to be an advocate of the law and of the justice system and that's how i was to use my first amendment rights as opposed to specifically speaking out or for specific positions i was now a champion of justice in the justice system so that has been for me the biggest con of going to the benches um, having to learn how to transition over to that the biggest pro is that I have been able to really bring my perspectives as an African-American woman, as someone that came from a middle-class family um, and parents who experienced discrimination. I bring that to the bench. It is a part of who I am. I utilize it in decisions that are made. And more importantly, when I'm in committees in the court and I'm one of the 53 judges, I use that lens to help guide my colleagues into the decision making seconds. to have perspectives that many of my colleagues don't have because they're not women of color and they don't come from the type of background that I come from. Great, thank you. Uh, question number two, Jason, would you like to read that one? Sure, <clears throat> and this question has uh, two parts. First part is, what have been the most effective methods for improving court procedures and efficiency? And the second question is, what other methods would you suggest? All right. First of all, let me just say the wheels of justice do turn, but they turn slowly. And our system is can be very archaic. Um, unfortunately, our system tends not to want to move from the old ways of doing things unless it's forced to. One of the best things that I think that has come about through this COVID uh, pandemic is that it is forcing our court to become modern in the way we approach uh, 
giving justice. We are being forced um, to have to do Zoom calls and some of my older colleagues are being forced to have to learn that technology is our friend. And that is the way that the mainstream communicates and mainstream is very comfortable with it and that we as a court system need to be comfortable with it so that we can continue providing services to those that we serve. Um, so Unfortunately, I would say one of the most effective methods for improving court procedures is crises and um, because it forces us to look at different alternatives. Another way is through um, engagement by our, uh, by our citizens. Oftentimes, what a voice I have tried to bring to the court is to engage our citizens more in the way that we make decisions and have committees that consist of not just judges, but people from our community so that we can have an understanding of what the community wants from us. Um, and that is one of the biggest things that I have been a strong advocate of since I've been on the bench is being more open to the courts and allowing the community to be involved in our decision making instead of the courts basically sitting up high and dictating to the community what and how we're going to serve them. Great, thank you. Uh, question three, Katie. Great. Um, as a judge, what would you consider your greatest strengths and weaknesses? Okay. One of my greatest strengths is that I'm a hard worker. Um, I actually was teased. I'm currently down at the RJC and I have been there actually since I came on the bench. And my colleagues would often tease me because I was always one of the first cars in the parking lot. And we have a specific judge's parking lot so you can see who's there and often I was the last to leave. Um, but I take my job very seriously and it, I see it as a duty of what I swore to do and that's to do the best that I can do and that requires um, being prepared and reading everything. I've learned, I have become known as a court that you don't walk into unprepared because I will be prepared. That is definitely a strength of mine is that I read everything and we as judges are given a lot of material to read and digest and often in a very short period of time people know they can count on me to read the materials that they submit. They also can count on me to not leave my perspectives and my experiences um, having all of the different jobs that I've done from being a prosecutor to a defense attorney to ALJ uh, to being a divorcee to being a survivor from um, an abusive domestic violent marriage. I bring all of those experiences into the courtroom and I draw upon them when making decisions and that too is one of my strengths is that I um, definitely make decisions from my whole person and my whole wealth of experiences. I think one of my weaknesses is that uh, I've had to learn how to accept that at the trial level, we don't often have the time that we'd like to do all of the research that we like and to be, um, we have to be nimble and we have to be able to move quickly about and that's definitely a weakness of mine because I like to know that I have thoroughly researched everything and Ten seconds. the best decision and sometimes we just have to make decisions with what we have in front of us. Thank you. Uh, question four, Hannah. Yeah. Um, can you please describe your most difficult case and tell us uh, why was it difficult and also how did you handle it? Okay. So that's a bit tricky. If I could take a moment of privilege to not answer the question, but ask you all a question and kind of clarify that question a little bit. Um, the rules of ethics prohibit me from really talking about cases that are still ongoing or with me or that I could have to make a decision on. So I don't know that I can answer that question directly. It could um, also be throughout your legal career. Okay, all right. Um, so I can, what the way I'm gonna choose to describe this to make sure that I'm in compliance with my ethical obligations is just talk about maybe the gender, the, the, the um, the, the types of cases that I find most difficult. So that's for your board's um, information, your membership's of, uh, information. That's how I'm gonna approach this question is, what are the most difficult type cases that I have to decide? And um, what I find most difficult in cases that come before me are generally cases where um, as human being, I may feel or think that a result should be one thing, but I'm bound by the law 
and the law doesn't necessarily uh, agree with what I personally believe. And those are very difficult at times and I have to be very clear and think through my decisions when I find myself um, going down that rabbit hole because I took an oath to uphold the law and that I have to uphold the law regardless of what I think it ought to be. So often um, those are very difficult times for me where I find the law may be at odds with my personal opinions or with my personal values. And how I handle that is just reminding myself that I took an oath to the law. Um, I find myself making sure that when I render my decisions in those cases, I write out my decision and what I'm going to say and I think it through so that I don't get off course and I've made a solid record that's based in legal analyses and not emotional implications. Okay, thank you. Um, and so now we're going to move on to our follow-up questions, and the responses to those will be one minute apiece. Um, uh, folks on the phone, if you have a follow-up question, you can raise your hand using the button, or you can type to me in the chat box. Hannah, yes, please go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you um, for meeting with us today. Um, so you mentioned uh, that you are a survivor of domestic violence, and I really appreciate you being candid about that and um, telling us about that. And I'm curious, so the, the justice system has not traditionally been the most safe and uh, effective place for survivors of domestic violence. And so I was wondering, like, what do you see as the role of, of judges um, in those situations, especially like you said, you're you know, doing criminal now, but also like in, it sort of spans across basically all forms of the law. So I'm curious, like kind of what you think a judge's role is in that situation. Okay. May I clarify just so that I can make sure that I'm answering your question. What I'm hearing you ask is what is the, literally, what is the role of a judge when a judge is faced with making decisions involving domestic violence? Is that pretty much a summary? Yes. And also like, how in your work as a judge, like how does that, how do you play into that um, sort of role? Okay, that's the part I'm a little confused about what you're asking me about. I guess just like how does sort of, I know you you just gave a really great explanation about how um, your, your role is to uphold the law in a big way. Um, and like how that's like the only thing you, that's what you're there for. It's not about your personal beliefs, but you also do have personal experience. And I feel like that must probably create some sort of space between the reading of the law, I guess. And so what is an individual okay. judge's role maybe in a situation like that? Okay. So what um, I see as a judge's role in a domestic violence, in any, any case that involves domestic violence, and for me particularly, obviously I'm very aware that that could be a trigger for me. I've worked very hard in separating that formal life from where I am when I'm wearing a robe. Um, one thing that I definitely, again, do is that and I think it's a very important that you acknowledge everyone in the courtroom. I think it's very important that a judge give a victim the space or um, um, to feel heard and and feel heard and uh, seen. But I think it's also important to hold abusers accountable, but also under have them understand that you see them and hear them too and that they don't necessarily have to be the worst Ten thing that they've ever done that they can change the way they go about things and that they too probably are a human that has been wounded and has a wounded soul that needs to address those issues great thank you uh are there any further follow-up questions J jeff Oh, Your Honor. Uh, as you know, the uh, court system and the legal system overall is um, vastly underfunded uh, in this state and elsewhere. So I'm wondering how you've used your role on the Superior Court and how you'll continue to use your role to advocate for uh, increased funding of our court system and the legal system. So one of the things that um, I am currently on our court's budget committee and we are working through what we thought was going to be a wonderful year of being able to have 
our highest of highest hopes and dreams to now um, looking at what will probably be a significant slash in our budget yet again. Uh, one of the things that I do again is try to um, use my voice to explain why certain things are important and need to be brought to the forefront. 30 of seconds. And then also reaching out when um, applicable through our Superior Court Judges Association to um, provide information to our lobbyists about things that are happening in our court that we need to address through our court's uh, lobbying system for additional funding. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Further questions. With that, I want to say I'm also on our, I was on our uh, Superior Court Judges Association Legislative uh, Committee this season. Further questions? Um, I have one. Um, so uh, it's with regard to um, access to legal to help within the legal system. Um, I know that not all citizens necessarily have that kind of access uh, that they might need. So uh, what do you believe uh, could be done to provide better access? I only have a minute to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> the top one, what do you would do? Where do you start? I mean, we need to it definitely use technology. I have been trying for a long time to get us to do some YouTube videos and different things like that to do tutorials about how to navigate your way. The King County library system does um, these wonderful programs of like how to be your own lawyer. I think that we need to be more engaged in those programs and that we as judges need to get out and offer our services to the best we can to talk to people about that. Um, I think that we, seconds. <laughs> um, we also need to make sure that we are giving access to and working with community groups um, to make sure that we are meeting different or um, organizations in different populations where they are and to address the needs and that we have languages. I mean, King County, the number of Ten languages seconds. that are available, we have not even touched on making sure that we provide information to all the languages that um, we need. And that's a big issue to me. Is that, I, mean, I could go on and on. I have a list that goes on and on. Oh, uh, I, I might I just give you another minute for that if you'd like and then I, yes yes so okay, we need to be understanding of how diverse our populations are and the different cultures the different languages we speak and making sure that we have means and opportunity to uh, reach out to those different organizations and that we understand them I, I personally believe one of the issues that I have with the court system personally that I'm trying to break the wall through is I often think that as judges, we think that because we're judges, people should just listen to us and they should do what we tell them to do and that they know we're here, come find us. And I think it should be the other seconds. Way. I think that we need to understand that we are there serving the people and we need to go out to the people and find out what the people need for us and how we can give them access to us easier. That's really big for me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Jason has raised his hand. You want to ask a question, Jason? Sure. Um, you know, this is kind of a, a hypothetical. Um, you know, uh, the judicial branch meets people, you know, where they're at. And they're in crisis. They're going through, you know, maybe we need to double the budget of the judicial branch to to assist people more effectively um what are your thoughts on that more money we'll take it we need it i mean there are so many things we need to do and we don't have the funding for them um i mean are you asking me do we need more money yeah we need more money i mean the civil legal needs uh, study that came out, well, it's been a while now, I wanna say it's probably been 10 years now that uh, came out that said for, you know, every one criminal need that people have, it, it opens the door to 10 
other civil matters that they need help with. 30 we'll, seconds. We'll give you a criminal attorney, but what about the fact that when you plead to this criminal case, now you all of a sudden find yourself in a family law or dependency case, and now you find yourself having to figure out what you're gonna do with your landlord, with your housing situation, because you no longer qualify for housing assistance. I mean, we seconds. need more funding. We need more funding. Thank you. Um, so we are at minute 19. Um, if you would like to go ahead with a, a wrap up uh, for one minute. Thank you. So I want to thank you again for um, giving me the opportunity to talk to you this evening. I am seeking your continued endorsement for this election cycle, just as you endorsed me in the 2016 election cycle. It has been my life's work to continue making sure that our court system is open and that we're providing access to justice to those who need us. I think you can see that I'm very passionate um, about making sure that the courts are, are more accessible to people and that they under and that we get out there and make ourselves known instead of the traditional way of judges, uh, people coming to judges. I've been working on, on different committees and groups since the time I joined the bench to make that a, more of a reality. I will continue with your support and with your endorse, endorsement and um, with the uh, election to my, my seat, I will continue to do those because that is the type of judge that we need. Not only experience that I have from all of the years of practicing and the three and a half years on the bench, but also the passion that I have about making sure people justice for everyone. Great, thank you so much.